well, the holiday season, and I'm a content creator, so I'm contractually obligated to do a holiday-themed episode. But since we're not doing one of the six other Flintstone Christmas specials I haven't gotten to yet, I can't wait. We're doing the quintessential holiday film. It's a wonderful life. Die Hard? I've always liked love, actually. Um, who are you? Zyla Gahathia, sixth dimensional winter elf in training. A sixth dimensional winter elf? Where did you come from? Hello, the sixth dimension. Oh, right. Um, what are the rules here? If I trick you into saying ape pagalix, will you go back there? <sighs> That's fifth dimensional imps. I'm a winter elf from the sixth dimension. I've heard of Christmas elves, but not... Winter elves handle all seasonal matters. Winter elves invented the peppermint latte. Every snowflake in the northern hemisphere is constructed by winter elves in a factory outside Chicago. Every Hallmark Christmas movie, even the ones that are supposed to be set in winter but are clearly shot in July, was written, directed, and produced by a winter elf. I see, but... What are you doing here? I was sent to observe your next three episodes. The big guy. Excuse me? The big guy? Yeah, you know, red suit, beard. Yeah, Jonathan Frakes. No, Santa. He said if I can make sure something doesn't happen, he'll greenlight my screenplay for a Hallmark movie. I call it Mary Chipmunks. It's about... Let me guess. Um, a young anthropologist returns home with her sign language chimp when her mother has a heart attack. She's only supposed to stay a week, but she falls in love with a zookeeper who happens to be a single dad. Maybe. Now, about your mission. I'm supposed to make sure that you don't make any Star Trek jokes in the next three episodes. Too late. Well, the order said Jess couldn't make them, so I, th I think we're good. Um, look, I see what's in it for you, but what about me? What do I get? The knowledge that you've helped another person? Would a truly altruistic YouTuber have a Patreon? Right. Uh, for each episode you can accomplish this, you get one wish. But if you fail, even once, I will make you watch the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie. Theatrical release or director's cut? Ow! Come on. Okay, just so we're clear. If I win, I get three wishes. But if I lose, I have to watch a movie I was probably going to get to in season four or five anyway. Uh-huh. Damn it, why did I have to get this challenge now? Is there a problem? Well, we're only doing the quintessential holiday film, Flash Gordon. How's that a Christmas movie? Flash. Ah! Savior of the universe! He's for every one of us. Stands for every one of us. Cut that out. You're right, I didn't get any flack for singing Born Free, but Nick Lowe's lawyers maybe donate $4 to Doctors Without Borders. Who knows what Brian May would charge me? Can you guys just get on with it? begins with a mysterious voice saying he wants a new planet to conquer. His assistant says, I know just the place. It's called Earth. They have nukes, so it won't be an easy conquest, but they aren't unarmed, so he won't get bored like the time he tried to take over McDonald land. The guy says, cool, great, let's do it. Our villain must be Kwame from the Planeteers because his reign causes a massive earthquake. All his minions cheer, and we see his ring gets his power from a doomsday machine capable of causing any type of disaster. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it has a button for Republican presidency. Then we get the opening credits. Let me tell you, we've had some pretty amazing theme songs on this show. Duke Mitchell's take on Did I Do. 
Mike Pogue's kick-ass Captain America theme song from 1979. Sherlock Holmes in the 22nd century. None of them compared to this movie. Having Brian May and Freddie Mercury do the soundtrack to Flash Gordon is a bit like going back in time, abducting Agatha Christie, and forcing her to write an episode of Murder, She Wrote. Back in New Jersey, this guy is sitting in a late 70s station wagon, reading the funny pages and listening to football on the radio. He's stuck in this rapidly changing weather. A van pulls up, and this woman whose hair and makeup screams local TV news reporter of the 70s gets out and boards a plane. The sweaty high school gym teacher gets out of the station wagon and follows her. The plane takes off, oblivious to the fact that it's in the middle of a meteor shower. The pilots are like Baltimore drivers, only airborne. They hit some turbulence. A big dumb jock asks if there's a problem. That's when I realized this wannabe Red Brown is Flash Gordon. News lady says, leave them alone, they're trying to fly. Flash says, okay, it's only turbulence, it'll be over soon. That's what she said. <laughs> Flash introduces himself. Dale says she already knows. Who hasn't heard of the greatest football star in the country? Flash looks shy and tries to flirt, but he's worse at it than I am. Or maybe not. Every time the plane bobs, she grabs him tighter and tighter. He tries to tell her it's nothing. He's a bit of an amateur pilot himself, and he starts to explain the physics of it all when the skies turn red. Which either means the Anti-Monitor is going to destroy the multiverse, or they're about to be abducted by aliens. Meanwhile, in a jungle somewhere, a flaming meteor falls onto the bed of a scientist who is just trying to get a good night's sleep. He wakes up his buddy. The guy's a bit grouchy and says, check the moon. They turn on the weather channel and the news reporter says that only Dr. Zarkov from NASA might have an explanation for all this. They race to the lab. Zarkov says, like hell I do. Munson looks at the data and thinks it must be an error, but once he sees how widespread the weird weather is, he reconsiders. Zarkov says, See, I've been right all along. Aliens are blasting the moon with gravity via space lasers in order to control our minds with fluoride. So Zarkov goes to this rocket he built. Munson's like, yeah, I'm not helping you with that. Zarkov says, well, I've got six reasons that you will. Munson still isn't convinced and runs away. Back on the plane, the pilots are struggling to regain control. A red beam with Max von Sydow's face destroys the windows and turns them into dust. Flash sees this, and he and Dale take over flying. The science guys are fighting over who's going to get into the rocket and save the world. Zarkov points his gun at Munson and says, You're going to do it, or I'm going to shoot you. Munson says, So... I either die now, or I die in five minutes when that thing blows up. You're almost out of bullets, so... Before he can even complete that thought, a plane crashes into the ground. That's right, two of our three plots have collided, and Munson goes into hiding again. Flash and Dale get out of the plane. Zarkov offers to let them use his phone, which he claims is in the rocket. Once he gets them in there, Dale's like, Hey, I recognize him. That's Zarkov, the famous mad scientist from TV. But it's too late. He has them at gunpoint. He tells them he needs a co-pilot, and he wants to keep Dale hostage. Obviously. Flash tries to intervene, but during the fight, Zarkov is smacked into a control panel. They are launched into space. Look on the bright side, Flash. At least you're not stuck up there watching Castle of Fu Manchu with a bunch of robots. 
Zarkov manages to get everyone to sit down and let him take the controls. You know, so they don't all die when they reach orbit. He even goes that extra mile to transmit a message of universal friendship. You know, like the one on the Voyager space probe. Great. Soon it'll come back and... It looks like somebody wants to watch Daredevil. Right. Anyway, the rigors of space travel are exhausting. They manage to sleep through traveling into a wormhole. They get spotted by an alien commander. Gee, I hope Flash doesn't accidentally kill that guy's brother. On the other hand, he would get three to four seasons of great television out of it. Lucky for Flash, these guys with fancy viewmasters guide their ship to a safe landing with their tractor beams. The ship touches down and Flash tells Dale they're not in Kansas anymore. Not only that, Lord Zed and a fleet of Goldars are there to greet them. Er, capture them. While waiting for their trial, Zarkov says these people are highly advanced. It's clear we can reason with them. Flash says, I don't know, they look like a police state. Zarkov says, but with every police state, there is an armed resistance. A robot flies in to direct them toward the big boss. Flash thinks about escaping. Then Kermit the Frog shows up and tries to do just that. Hey, it looks like Doc Hopper finally got his wish. Zarkov says he still has his gun. He could take out one of the guards and make it look like he was acting alone. It's a logical transaction. One life for billions. That plan lasts about as long as it takes them to get through the metal detectors. The robot disintegrates the gun. On the way to see the Emperor, they walk to the main hall at Comic-Con. You'd think first contact with an alien species would be a really big thing. But the Wakandans and the Thanagarians seem more intent on killing each other than see it. Then again, for us, first contact with an alien species would be the most important day of our life. For them, it's Tuesday. While watching the various groups pay their tributes to Ming the Merciless, Flash catches the eyes of an evil space lady. He doesn't even notice when the Thanagarians pick another fight. With James Bond and his merry men. King T'Challa says, My people have no crops this year. Ming's environmentally racist policies killed them. All my people have is their loyalty. Ming says, Prove it. Stab yourself through the heart. T'Challa says, Dude, what the f***? So Ming blasts him with a paralyzer beam and says, I should have listened to Dad. If you want something done right, do it yourself. Flash whispers an insult about Ming, and the flying C-3PO head repeats it. Ming orders their execution be sped up, but they're allowed a speech. Afterward, Ming says, humans are obviously an unintelligent species. If they were smart, they wouldn't have stuck their nose where it doesn't belong, or gone somewhere they were fully unprepared to be. Ming uses his ring to enthrall Dale. She starts to orgasm. He asks his Major Domo if he's ever seen anything like it. His Major Domo says, no, in fact, she even rivals your daughter. Ming laughs and, damn, I haven't seen that kind of behavior in a world leader since... <laughs> 2020. Uh-huh. Ming orders Dale be taken to the pleasure room. Flash objects and that theme song starts playing. Ah, fuck yeah. But even better... You have that Queen soundtrack playing over a fight done in the style of that master of screen combat, Adam fucking West. And Flash gets his ass kicked. Well, until the crowd sees one man stand up and say, you might win, but not today. That's all it takes for the crowd to go, you know, he's right. Why waste all this energy fighting each other when we could all fight Ming. Somehow, Flash gets this orb, and the fight becomes much more violent. It becomes a football game. Since Flash plays for the New York Jets, we know how this is going to end. They'll do pretty well, but completely blow it in overtime. Now The Simpsons is going to start at 8.35 and fuck up everybody's DVRs. 
And you can blame Zarkov for accidentally pelting Flash in the head with the ball for that. Flash gets knocked out. Ming's daughter says, Oh, Daddy, it's my birthday. Can I have them, please? Ming's like, Yeah, you know I could never say no to you, but what about Prince Baron? She says, Baron is so last week. They go to Flash's execution. She kisses Bond goodbye and says, I'll see you soon, okay? Niles Calder calls her on her crap and says, In 20 minutes, you'll be boning a bird boy. She says, I love you too. Bye bye. Meanwhile, Flash is awaiting his last request, which is to see Dale. You idiot! If you knew they had to honor your last request, it should have been, Don't kill me. They make their goodbyes and it's time to die now! Flash is put to the gas chamber with incense and peppermints. Later, Princess Aura and Dr. Demento go to the tomb of Flash Gordon and inject him with Red Bull. Then, you got an empty tomb. Booyah! I told you this was a Jesus movie. Well, if Jesus woke up and Mary Magdalene said, yeah, I'd love to fuck you right now, but I've got to get you off planet to meet up with the Resistance. Flash is kind of against this because he wants to go rescue his friends. She says, try to do that now and you're dead. Come back with an army and you just might have a shot. So he leaves Zarkov, a Holocaust survivor, to be reprogrammed into a tech geek for Ming science forces and Dale to be used as a comfort woman. Because like a true hero, he's got to serve the greater good. During the re-education process, Ming tells Zarkov that every thousand years, the planet Mongo does horrible things to other planets. They only found Earth because of Zarkov's message. Which means all that destruction isn't Ming's fault, that's pure Zarkov. Wait, he's supposed to believe that an eons-old system of ritualistic genocide is the fault of a middle-aged man? I don't see how. Nor does Ming give him much time to respond. He uses Megatron's mind probe on him and pries every thought Zarkov has ever had out of his head and replaces them with state-sponsored propaganda. He tells Eva Lin not to go above level 3 programming, but she maxes him out anyway. Meanwhile, on their way to the moon, Princess Aura can't decide if she wants to teach Flash how to fly a spaceship or seduce him. So she tries to do both at once. Multi-action penalties being what they are, she fails both roles. She gets a saving throw with the old, but I saved your life routine, but she botches that as well. Meanwhile, Dale and the head of the harem are preparing for the big event. She tells Dale, drink this, it's, it's... Green. You thought you could sink that past me. You said it, not me. I was gonna go with, this drink has no name, but many bothans died to bring us this beverage. Anyway, its properties make their job easier. Because it makes them horny. It doesn't make them forget, but it makes it so they don't mind remembering. So whatever it is, it's not tequila. Instead of asking if this drink is even safe for humans, Dale is like, bottoms up. Princess Aura puts on her telepathy helmet and calls Prince Baron. Floss is like, cool, show me how to call Dale. She's like, no way. Flash pulls the ship into a dive. She's like, what are you doing? That's a super cold planet, we'll both die. Flash says, just let me call the girl I met an hour ago who's at least from the same planet I am. We both know long distance relationships don't work. She says, you're right, and Flash pulls up. Dale starts hearing Flash in her head, but assumes it's a side effect of whatever she just drank. Flash tries to explain that it's telepathy while Aura climbs all over him. He tells Dale to sit tight and distract Ming. Is it just me, or is this bordering on a telepathic Adriel. A slave girl comes in to tell Dale that Ming is on his way. Dale offers her some of her magic ecto-cooler. She says, as a slave, I can't. Dale says, I won't tell if you won't. 
Really, Dale, what's your end game here? Are you going to Luke Skywalker your way out of there in the slave girl's clothes and leave her to tend to Ming's needs for you? Because that's some Law and Order SVU bullshit. The guards come in to check on Zarkov's progress. So far, he's memorized his name, rank, unit, and serial number. In the Mongolian army, that's all you need to know. A lot of things are going on. Flash and Aura arrive in the Dacoba system. Ming arrives at the Pleasure Cave to go to work on Dale. And whoa, I was joking about that escape plan. But since this is a PG movie, Ming figures it out pretty quick. He says, a Mongolian woman? Why would I want to have sex with one of my own species? Ew, 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 Gross. On her way out the door, Dale sees a guard, kills him, and takes his gun. She waits for another one to come along and wash, rinse, repeat. She does this until she has an arsenal. But by the time she gets to the fourth or fifth guy, she gets a bit confused and takes the fancy shoes and leaves the guns. Meanwhile, at the Verizon Customer Service Center, she's spotted on the security feed. They come up with the perfect agent to recapture her. Zarkov. There's a small chance she might trust him, or at least trust him more than she trusts them. At first, it seems to work. She tells him about Flash being alive and the telepathy. She doesn't notice his monotone voice, or they seem to be doing a Sun Boy cosplay. These should be dead giveaways that Zarkov isn't Zarkov anymore. But what do you expect? Dale Arden is literally sci-fi's original damsel in distress. Ming asks, why are you letting her get away? Maleficent says, it's part of the plan. Zarkov is with her. We have trackers in Zarkov. She goes to Flash, Zarkov comes along. Trust me, if we don't have Dale, Zarkov, and Flash back here in 20 minutes, your pizza's free. Ming says, sounds cool, but we should probably track down the traitor who brought him back from the dead. Ben Grimm smiles and says, yeah, but does it matter who it is? Ming says, of course not. Flash and Aura are hanging out outside the Keebler elves' house. She says, it's the prince's birthday. We'll go in after it's over. They arrive just in time as they're just finishing up with the piñata. All the prince has to do is stick his hand in the right hole to avoid getting bitten by a scorpion. The poor kid fails. Baron has to stab him as a mercy killing. Aura crashes the party. Baron kisses her. He says to prepare a feast. She's like, no, I gotta go. I just came to drop off Flash. If I'm gone too long, my dad'll find out, and that would mean the end of this whole rebellion thing. Baron isn't too pleased. He says, I know what you two have been doing. Aura says, nothing happened. Besides, everyone thinks Flash is dead. This is no biggie. Back to Dale and Zarkov. Things are looking up on that front. Zarkov was only faking his allegiance to Ming. When he was getting his mind wiped, he repeated important stuff back to himself. Shakespeare, Einstein, the Torah, and most important of all, Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, number 106. You can't forget that story even if you tried. This process allowed him to resist mind control. Dale is so caught up in Zarkov's story of how he kept his mind intact that she doesn't even notice that Hawkman and the entire Thanagaran police force is right behind them. James Bond has Flash Gordon in a cage with a bunch of other prisoners. Flash says, why can't we do things the way we did at the palace? You know, grown-up Peter Pan and the Lost Boys, Harvey Birdman, and I up against Ming the Merciless. Dalton orders them thrown into the bog of eternal snatch. Flash thinks to himself, you know, next time I'm on an alien planet, I should bring a team. I wonder what the Phantom and Mandrake are doing these days. Princess Aura gets caught and Lashina is punishing her. The Major Domo is questioning her, or rather writing her confession just in case she dies in the course of interrogation, which means Planet Mongo isn't that much different than Chicago. No, wait, he's planning to do something with worms, which seems more like a... Tsk, tsk, tsk. No references to you-know-what. What? I was gonna say a Baltimore thing? 
Aura says she's a princess. When her father finds out about this, heads are going to roll. She wants to speak with him. Cloaky McCloakerton says, Sure, uh, hey, boss, your traitorous daughter wants to waste her last phone call on you. Do you accept the charges? No? Okay, I'll tell her. Prince Baron is still on the forest moon of Endor. He knows he's being played, but he feels like he should be doing something. You know, like killing Flash. So he and Horatio start brainstorming ways to do that without pissing off the princess. They consult Xanatos' big book of plans. It says to send someone down to rescue the prisoners and let them go on their way to the royal court to fight me. Either A, they die in the attempt, which would make the princess single again. Or B, Gordon would succeed, go home, and be out of Aura's reach. Either way, Baron wins. Shiny Face asks, when are we going to kill your daughter? Ming says, we're not. I'm going to marry Dale. We're going to send Aura to Phrygia for about a year. She'll come back without pesky traits like free will. Just to prove she's obedient, I'm going to marry her off to the ugliest son of a bitch on the planet. The Major Domo says, can you make it 18 months? I'm going to have to shovel my grandma in from the Andromeda Galaxy. She's got colitis, so it's going to be a whole thing. Those Hawkmen who captured Galen Zarkov, they don't like Ming much either. They escort them to the palace of King Richard IV. They think they're safe because he doesn't work for Ming. That doesn't mean he won't do business with them. He sold them to Ming. Zarkov says, why? You hate him. You'll use any excuse to attack him. Brian Blessed mumbles, yes. He knows this and expects it. So I have to deal with him in good faith. Sooner or later, he'll forget I hate his guts. Then I can kill him. Zarkov says, good luck with that. Dale says you think you can take on Ming? You couldn't even beat up Flash Gordon. Hawkman says, he's dead. Dale says, nope. Boss Nass asks, Gordon's alive? Zarkov responds, yes, and he's working with Prince Baron. Hawkman says, Baron, that wuss? Who needs help now, loser? Zarkov says, maybe we do and maybe we don't. How many military leaders do you know have ever won a battle on two fronts? Hawkman says, hmm, you got a point there. The prisoners get out of the cage. They make Flash take his Presidential Physical Fitness Award test in order to get direction to a hidden weapons stash. But when they get there, all they find is... Timothy Dalton. He says, yeah, it's a trap. Guilty as charged. I don't like you, so I'm going to make you do some real Legends of the Hidden Temple bullshit in order to earn my trust. Flash asks, how long is this going to take? Bond says, well, you got to play Russian roulette with a scorpion, and then you got to listen to me rehearse my solid five for open mic night, so I'm guessing maybe 15 minutes tops. Flash tires of the game after, oh, the fifth round. He fakes getting stung. Then he asks Baron for the mercy. Then he punches him, takes his sword, and runs off into the jungle. Baron's army wants to go after him, but Baron says no. I handle this alone. Flash gets caught in quicksand. He holds his breath and eventually pulls himself up by what he thinks is a vine. Once he's on dry land, he's exhausted and takes a nap. But that thing he was pulling on? Yeah, it was fucking Cthulhu. Prince Baron comes along. He says, hey, you, Eldritch Horror, you don't get to eat him. He's my kill. He shoots the beast and is about to shoot Flash right between the eyes when more hawk police show up. They go, your highness, our boss wants to talk to you. Meanwhile, back on Spaceball 1, a pair of assholes report the shiny guy. They say they've found Gordon and Baron in the company of some hawk police. Shiny guy says, are they here yet? The guards say no. So he says, then let me get my beauty sleep. 
After all, in a year's time, I'm going to be a married man, so I need all the rest I can get. Baron says, isn't selling me to Ming against some sort of treaty we have or something? Big Bird says, yeah, but if our situations were reversed, what would you do? Baron says, sell you to Ming in a heartbeat. But at least I'd bring up your right to trial by combat. Voltan says, well, you're not fighting me. Baron says, why would I want to when Gordon is right here? Voltan says, Oh, why didn't you say so? Go on ahead. Dale and Zarkov are being escorted somewhere else in Hawk City. Zarkov says, assuming time and gravitation are constant here, we have 17 more hours before the moon crashes into the Earth and we have nothing left to go back to. Dale says, it's too bad we don't know where Flash is. The doors open looking down on the arena. Dale says, Oh, wait. Flash and Dale are about a sweet moment before he's dragged into the pits. He and Baron immediately start wrestling. Until Baron realizes that's the type of combat where Flash excels. So he goes for one of the conveniently placed whips. He gets a few good shots in, and the crowd is screaming for blood. Voltan thinks it's taking too long, so he takes out this remote that makes the floor tilt. Not only that, Hawk City is miles above the ground. So if they fall, it's a long way down. Almost enough time to watch the director's cut of a Peter Jackson movie. Flash gets the upper hand, but Voltan pushes another button on his remote that makes metal spikes come out of the platform. They retract at random. Flash and Baron take turns almost pitting each other, and Flash says, I'm willing to die, but if you kill me, you should team up with Voltan and take out me. It for not. Baron almost falls off. Flash saves him, and Baron surrenders. Flash refuses to kill him. Voltan calls bullshit. Baron says, no, Flash is right. Look at all this chaos we caused. Now imagine if we used our combined destructive power against me. He wouldn't last 20 minutes. Voltan says, that's crazy talk. The guard come in and say, uh, remember how we called Ming's guy a little while ago to pick up Dale and Zarkov? Well, they're here now. Voltan says, <laughs> Have I ever told you two how much I would love to join an interspecies alliance against the oppressive Ming regime? The robot Grim Reaper tells Zarkov, For your traitorous behavior, I'm going to have you vaporized. No, wait, Voltan and his men are traitors too, and Baron is considering it. In order to save time, money, and energy, once I'm off this flying city, I'm just going to vaporize the entire place and be done with it. Flash and Baron shove him onto the death platform, and... Um, how do I describe this? He's either got marshmallow eyes, he isn't a robot like I assumed, or he's Judge Doom. In any case, it doesn't matter. He's dead. Voltan is mad. Before they did that, he at least had a chance of talking Ming down. Baron says he wasn't joking about that alliance thing. Voltan says, and risk having my soldiers face actual Death? Baron says you have little choice now. Sultan says, oh yeah? And then decides to go fight Ming on his own. Dale asks, aren't you going to take us with you? Sultan says, no, now go fuck yourselves. Flash says they could reach the surface if they made parachutes out of curtains. Dale says they're miles up, so that's a stupid plan. Sarkov says we would reach terminal velocity in a few hundred feet. So in theory, it could work. And even if it doesn't, taking any action against oppression is better than getting vaporized. But Zarkov sees Ming's ship is still there and comes up with a plan he thinks has a better shot. He knows Ming will do anything to get his hands on Dale, so he waves the white flag of surrender. Ming shows up to take Zarkov and Dale. Flash wonders why he's being left behind. 
Ming says, because it's the third act of a space opera. You know, where the villain offers the hero a Faustian bargain. I won't let you save your planet, but I offer you a kingdom. You can rule it any way you want. What do you say, deal? Flash says, get bent. Ming says, okay, what if I offered to spare the Earth? Flash says, you can do that? Ming goes, sure, I mean, human society would still be destroyed, but as my viceroy, you would be the sole source for food, water, electricity, and everything else. Providing the essential things to survive would make people compliant. Flash asks, what about Dale? Ming says, no, she's mine. Okay, maybe you can have my sloppy seconds once I'm bored with her and have given her every STI in the known galaxy. Flash says, that'll be a hard pass. Ming says, suit yourself. Ming goes back to the yellow submarine and starts firing on Hawktown. Dale and Zarkov start crying because Flash is done for. Or maybe not. He John McClane's it down the elevator shaft and finds the Hawk people have left a hover jet ski behind. He uses the explosions as cover to blast the hell out of there. The Hawk men are hanging out with the arboreal people. They're saying, you know, Flash wasn't so bad. He got rid of Rockface for us. Voltan says, yeah, my bad. I totally let my bruised ego get in the way there. But he's dead now, so things are hopeless. What do you know? Flash calls. He says, I'm not dead. Do you have some way I can find you? Voltan says, sure, I can turn on a homing beam. Flash says, cool, I got Queen preloaded on my iPod. Let's go rescue Dale, Zarkov, and Baron, and take on Ming. Voltan says, sounds good to me. Dale prepares for her fourth wedding to Ming. They throw Princess Aura in with her. The princess tries to tell her they have much bigger concerns right now, but Dale won't listen. Either that, or she thinks a cat fight would look great in the movie's trailer. Don't look at me like that. This movie was produced by Dino De Laurentiis. Anyway, after they've done as much of that as they can get away with in a PG movie, Dale decides to trust Aura. Even after the zillions of times she's backed at her. Aura says, here, take this potion. Dale says, what? No, this fourth wedding is bad, but I'm not going to kill myself. Aura says, no, slip it into my dad's drink before he goes to bed. Dale says, I promised to be a good wife and he promised not to destroy the earth. Aura says, you bought that? Now I understand why he got Herbal Life Salesman of the Year in this sector 300 times. Another slave girl shows up to gather everyone for the wedding. Dale says, no one can help me now. A lot of stuff happens. The army spots Flash. They decide to not alert Ming on his wedding night. They try blasting Flash out of the sky. Flash meets up with the Hawkmen and none of it matters. I don't care, you don't care. The screenwriter doesn't care. And did you know why? Because that theme song starts playing. This movie knows who and what its star is and lets it do its thing. It's 10 minutes of music, effects, and not a lot of plot. If you remember my review of a certain other movie that I will not name, you'll know that's not usually something I enjoy in a movie. But here, it's pure ball-to-the-walls insanity, and I love every goddamn frame of it. This... This is the movie Ice Pirates wishes it was. But all good things must come to an end. The wedding is about to begin. But first, the presents, by which I mean the executions of Zarkov and Baron. Uh, Mongolians? Mongoanites? Whatever. You could have just gotten the happy couple a toaster. 
Aura is pissed at her father, you know, for threatening to exile her to Alaska planet and plotting to marry her off to a literal stone-cold killer. You can forgive her for making other plans. She's gonna spend a nice, quiet evening rescuing Baron and Zarkov. Flash overhears the wedding on the radio. He decides he's gonna leave blasting Wing ship to hell to the Hawkmen. He's gotta go play Dustin Hoffman at the end of The Graduate. Voltan tries to get Flash to bail before their ship hits the force field and they die. Flash says they have no chance of destroying the Doomsday Weapon without someone at the wheel. Voltan says, you're crazy. Flash says, no, it's a logical transaction. One life for billions. Having just become a refugee himself about 20 minutes ago, Voltan understands. Baron and Zarkov break into the command center. They ask for directions to Ming. They say, why would we tell you? Zarkov says, take one of their viewmasters. It turns out they're wired in sequence. You kill one guy, you kill them all. Now they have to kill Goth Lady Aberlin to keep her from sounding the alarm. Meanwhile, at the other control center, this guy says, hey, we've got a ship charging our lightning screen. If it hits, we've got a mutually assured destruction event. Zarkov says not all Mongolians are like Ming. They should turn off the lightning screen to save them. Baron says, if you want to travel down six miles to the atomic batteries, be my guest. Zarkov is a genius, so he figures that's a really stupid way to run a defense system. So while Baron goes on a killing spree, he does what any Nobel Prize winning physicist would do. He pushes every button, like a three-year-old in an elevator. Ming and Dale are up on the platform. The minister says, marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. Then we get some rather one-sided vows and the new major domo pretending to lose the rings. It might seem cute, but it gives 007 the chance to find the right control panel for the lightning screen and blow up the kingdom come. Which helps Flash because it makes destroying the doomsday machine a lot easier. And if Zarkov's numbers are right, they've got less than two minutes to save the world. Flash crashes into the building and his ship impales me. It's a bit anticlimactic, but I'll take it. No, wait, he, um, literally walks it off. So we get that big good versus evil fight that we wanted. Ming says, I'm invincible! Flash says, you're a loony. Ming uses his ring to disappear into the sequel we never got. Really, 80s people? This movie was a flop? You gave us seven police academies? And nine Ernest movies? but only one Flash Gordon? I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Baron says I destroyed the Doomsday Weapon, but sure, go on celebrating Flash. I'll go on to make the living daylights and Sam will drink Mountain Dew from the same Solo Cup for 30 years because he can't afford another one until Ted comes out. Oh yeah, and Ming was a usurper. I'm the real king, but I don't want war anymore, so, hey, Voltan, how does being the new chief of the army sound? Voltan says, will I get to hit stuff when we're under attack? Baron says, uh-huh. Voltan asks, and will we go bowling every Tuesday during peacetime? Baron says, sure, why not? Voltan says, that's all I ever wanted. Flash and Dale go home. We get a reprise of that kick-ass theme song again, and that's it. That's the movie. Yes! During Saturday morning cartoon chaos, we didn't have time for a rap rant. And ooh, how I miss them. But let's try to keep this one short. Is the story good? No. It's convoluted as fuck. Is the acting good? No. Sam Jones walked off the set in post-production 
and a lot of his lines got redubbed. Chaim Topol, Brian Blessed, Timothy Dalton, and Max von Sydow seemed to be having a competition to see who'd be the first to get indigestion from devouring scenery. But if you top that off with great practical effects and a soundtrack by May and Mercury, this movie saves itself with a mighty hand. Wait, that's all you do. S summarize the movie, make a few wisecracks, and then give your opinion on the film. No, my four regular viewers assume that's it, but whether or not it's a good movie or a bad movie isn't my only criteria. I also factor in how much it costs to obtain or stream. But wouldn't that allow movies that are utter crap to get a passing grade? Yeah, it happens all the time. The reverse is more of a rare occurrence. What do you mean? A movie can be great, good, or just entertaining, but if it costs too much to obtain, then it simply isn't worth it. When I started this show, I thought that would be a theoretical concept. It doesn't take six dimensional senses to smell a butt coming. But it's happened a few times. One of those being Ice Pirates. What are you doing next episode? Mystery Alaska. You are so screwed. If you like this video, please hit like and subscribe to see this channel grow and get your name on the credits. Visit patreon.com slash films and become a patron today. Give us enough money and just might let you have a say in some of the movies we watch in the 2022-23 season.